a little bit different from NaCl. Even though when both HCl and NaCl hit water, they both ionize completely to their cations and anions, HCl doesn't really do that within an ordinary sample of HCl. So HCl actually exists as a gaseous molecule, whereas, of course, NaCl exists as a solid. NaCl is a solid because it has much stronger ionic interactions between its positive cations and negative anions within the solid phase, but HCl exists as just an ordinary molecule. And if we had a collection of HCl, we just have a collection of individual molecules where they're not all interacting in that plus minus way like NaCl is. NaCl is not really a molecule at all. It's just a bunch of plus and minus anions all attracted together. So when we look at something like NaCl, even our strong bases, the hydroxide compounds that are water soluble, those are our strong bases. Um, those are all ionic compounds. And so then if you start thinking about the acids that we learned how to name, they're all molecular compounds. So all the acids from our nomenclature are molecular compounds. And it's just a question if it's one of the seven strong acids. So if we remember, it's HCl, Br, and I, nitric chloric, perchloric, so HCl, uh, HNO3, HClO3, HClO4, and then just that first H off of sulfuric, the H2SO4. So every other acid, like phosphoric, sulfurous, um, hydrofluoric, HF, so all these other acids would just be considered to be weak acids. And so then the last thing, I guess, would be, well, what about this, like, ammonium chloride? What about the ammonium salts? Um, because usually we look at ionic compounds as, like, a metal and a nonmetal, but it turns out that NH4Cl is best characterized as being comprised of a cation and an anion. So if you had, say, a solid of ammonium chloride, you would characterize that as being an ionic compound. So even though you look at that and say it only contains non-metallic elements, it's important that we recognize ammonium really forms with the plus charge, chloride forms with the minus charge, so we really do have ions present within a sample of ammonium chloride. That just kind of helps us keep our lingo straight. So when we start thinking of ionic compounds, we're classifying their solubilities. And when those compounds are soluble, we're determining that there's strong electrolytes in water. So they'll make a solution that has, say, a light bulb with two electrodes light up because the solution will contain a lot of ions within it. So the ionic compounds that are water soluble completely ionize through that solubility process. So then another question came up with sulfuric, or uh, uh, yeah, with sulfuric acid because we talked about how it's one of the seven strong acids. We also then mentioned how it's a diprotic acid, meaning it has two H pluses that it could give to a solution, but it just doesn't give that second one off completely. So H2SO4 would lose the first H to 100% yield, form HSO4 minus the hydrogen sulfate anion, plus H plus, and then that HSO4 minus ion, just in a weak sense, gives off that second H and then the sulfate ion. But it gives some of it off, and if you add base, one of the keys, we'll see a couple more examples of this, if we were to add base to this solution, um, it's gonna rip off every H plus that's acidic. So whether or not it's strongly acidic doesn't matter. So if we were to add like KOH, it's gonna take both those two H pluses, make OH minus and H plus combine together to form water. So we'll go through some more examples of acid-base reactions here today. But I wanted to point out that we would call H2SO4 a strong acid, because it loses that first H plus completely. But then we call it a diprotic acid because it has two H pluses total to lose. But then we just wouldn't call it a strong diprotic acid. Or if you think about it, we're not saying it strongly loses both. We're still saying it's a strong acid because it loses one H plus, and the diprotic because it can lose two H pluses. Now, if we go to uh, something like phosphoric, like phosphoric isn't strong in that it's not losing any of those H pluses completely, um, yet it could lose all three if we were to add KOH. So if we add like three moles of KOH, then we can have three moles of KOH react with H3PO4. Let's write that reaction real quick. So if we write H3PO4, we could react it with KOH. Then our product, as long as we add enough KOH, we're gonna make K3PO4 aqueous, and then H2O. So the H pluses are falling off, the OH minuses are combining together to make water, and we're gonna end up with three waters when we use three KOHs. Okay, so even though H3PO4 is not a strong acid, it can still lose those H pluses. We just have to add a base to get them off. So in this case, we're adding KOH and we're forming water. Uh, water is a liquid here for tracking the states. Phosphoric acid, aqueous. We just know it's in water, hence it's reacting. We're not really characterizing the solubility of the molecular compounds exactly. 
But if it's an acidic substance, it's going to be dissolved in water. So if you know you have a weak base, um, if you have a weak or strong acid in water, they're going to be water soluble. But other molecular compounds, like if you talk alcohols, hydrocarbons, we're not characterizing their water solubility. So it's a little confusing when you come into this chapter because there's obviously like millions of different compounds that exist. And we're just characterizing the water solubility of the ionics and then um, generally understanding that these acids and bases are going to be water soluble. Um, like so the strong uh, acids and the strong bases, uh, excuse me, the strong acids and the weak acids should be water soluble. And then everything else we're not really considering in terms of water solubility. Um, so then we look at something like um, acetic acid. I don't want us to recognize the four H's on that compound as all being acidic. It's really just the one. You almost have to picture the naming. Come back to naming and sort of picture losing an H plus. Does that lead to an ion that you know how to name? If we lose an H plus off of this compound here, we get acetate. And then that's, that's where we end with acetic acid. If we add more KOH, we're not going to get any of those H pluses that come off that carbon. Now, the way you, the checklist in your head should be, if I lost another H plus, but I know how to name the substance, and you don't, so that, that's a good tell that the substance is not going to be able to lose any more H pluses. So just some of the lingo is kind of complicated when you first get started in the chapter in terms of understanding what it means to be water soluble. For the ICs, it means that they're dissociating into their ions. Uh, for the molecular compounds, it means some of them fully dissociate, the strong acids, but some of them remain intact, like the weak acids. Um, and so then today, we're just going to go through some more. So let me bring up the solubility chart. This is the mostly soluble compounds on the top, nitrate, acetate. We also mentioned ammonium and the alkali cations are completely soluble no matter what you pair with them. Um, and I mentioned how the textbook puts that into like writing in a paragraph format. So we can also add that the NH4 plus cations are always soluble as well as the alkali cations. I don't know why the book doesn't add them to this particular chart, but this is just a chart from your textbook. Chloride, bromide, iodide is generally soluble. Only weird thing here is mercury. It's the H2 2 plus ion that is uh, insoluble when paired up with Cl minus, Br minus, I minus. But if you take the ordinary Hg2 plus, pair that up with chloride, bromide, iodide, those are actually still water soluble. So Hg2 plus is not an exception. So generally soluble in the top part of the chart, sulfates generally soluble. We had the issue with calcium last time. That was for like an old test we used to take where I wanted calcium included. We don't need to include calcium anymore, so don't worry about calcium. This is just the, the four cations shown in our textbook. Um, and then sulfide hydroxide have the same sort of grouping, and then carbonate and phosphate have the same grouping of ions that, in their case, generally insoluble, but with those exceptions. For all of them, we should know the exceptions should at least be ammonium cations and the alkali cations, because anything paired up with those are water soluble. We just see that you get three additional cations in the case of sulfide and hydroxide. Again, I don't know who made this chart, why they grouped the two separated that have the same exceptions, so I don't know, whoever made this chart silly, but. Um, the, uh, the one thing you may wonder, what about all the other ions we learned how to name? If you notice here, this is not an extensive lift, list of all the different anions that we've come across in our nomenclature. The answer is all the other anions are a little bit more complicated. Um, so the other anions in terms of, say, um, like the chlorates, the perchlorates, the chlorites, all those other ions have a little bit more complexity to their rules. They don't fall into like a neat set of uh, rules like these ions here. So we're just going to keep our list to these particular ions shown here. So let's come to this question. Let me see where we're at. I think I'll give you guys about a minute to finish this if you have a question yet. So yeah, I'll start a minute timer. So you guys can chat about this too if you want for a minute.
Okay, so let's take a look at this one here. So for the question that's asking which compounds a strong electrolyte in water. So generally what you might want to think, is it an ionic compound or molecular? So you might even address like the IC versus MC. So let me switch pen colors. So KOH is obviously an ionic compound. Is it water soluble is the next question. It is water soluble. Everything containing potassium is water soluble. Um, so this is a water soluble ionic compound. So this is definitely a strong electrolyte in water. Um, and then because it's making hydroxide ion, it's not really part of the question here, but we could also characterize this substance as being a strong base. So the hydroxide ion being the particular anion that's given off into the solution, anything that's making hydroxide ions a base, if you make sort of one hydroxide ion per one mole of the substance, then you're classifying that substance as a strong base. Now, what about the next category here? So that's acetic acid. That's like our, one of our prototypical weak acids. So that would form a weakly electrolytic solution. Um, we saw that last time it sort of partially lit up the light bulb, but not totally, because we don't get um, sort of two moles of ions per one mole of that compound dissolving in water. We only get some fraction of that. So we remain with a um, reasonable number of acetic acid molecules floating around the solution that are still intact with the H plus attached to the acetate ion. So then this is a weakly acidic solution. So it's like in the case of acetic acid, I'm, I'm almost thinking first it's a weak acid and then getting that it's a weak electrolyte. And then for the case of like KOH, it's almost like I'm probably picturing it's a strong electrolyte first and then reasoning out it's, it's a strong base from there. So again, for acetic acid, the thought process is, is it one of the seven strong acids? No, so therefore it's just a weak acid, weak electrolyte. Methanol's a trick, okay? So methanol is one like a catch-all for, if it was an acid, we would have named it something acid because it would have been important to note that it's acidic um, and would form an acidic solution. It's not named something acid, it's just named methanol. Um, and then it also contains like the OH group, but that doesn't mean it's gonna give the OH group off in solution either. So we haven't seen any cases of these molecular compounds being basic and their behavior. So methanol doesn't give off hydroxide ions, so it's not any type of base. It doesn't give off that H plus either, so it's not any type of acid. And so then the other question would be, well, if it's not giving hydroxide ions or H plus, is there any other way it can make ions in solution? The answer is no. So this is just a simple non-electrolyte. Now, you could say, now how do you know it's water soluble? Um, you don't necessarily have to know a compound like this is water soluble, but it's, the question would be like, if it's in water, would you expect it to be electrolytic? Would you expect it to be ionized? The answer would be no. So there's no way that we can consider methanol to be any type of acid or base. When it's a molecular compound, so when we're looking at a molecular compound, we're thinking bases, our prototype is NH3. So think nitrogen with th three things attached to it. We tend not to go through too many examples here in general chemistry. You might see more examples in OCHEM, but you might see some examples like NCH33. But you're picturing like a nitrogen with like three things attached. That's your prototype for something that's, you know, has that basic behavior. And then PBI2 is water insoluble. So we look at this compound here, we see it's insoluble. And so therefore, PBI2 is really not dissolving into the solution. So since it's not in the solution, it's not gonna form a strongly electrolytic solution. It really doesn't make any solution. We just have PBI2 at the bottom of the test tube and then water on top. So imagine you throw two electrodes in connecting to a light bulb into the solution. Think about whether or not that light bulb should light up. The light bulb is only gonna light up when we have a lot of ions that hit the solution. KOH makes a lot of ions in the solution, so the light bulb would light up. That's why we call it an electrolytic solution. If we did that with the acetic acid like we did in our demonstration, partially lights the light bulb up, Methanol wouldn't light it up at all, and then PBI2 wouldn't light the light bulb up either. Now, I did mention that some of the insolubles technically do have some small solubility. That's a topic for later. That's not one that we're gonna address here today. So, technically, some of the insoluble compounds have a tiny bit of solubility, but it's not going to be enough ions to really cause, say, light bulbs to light up or make the solution strongly electrolytic. So we would just look at this and say it's not any type of electrolyte because it's not in the solution. That's a property of a solution, not a property of just water. So it would only be one here. Follow-ups on sort of that. So this is like a, a good summary of like nomenclature, if you will, for this chapter and some vocabulary. So if you're not totally clear on what electrolytes mean, just do some more practice problems. So this is a summary chart um, that's also given in the textbook. This is probably the most confusing chart in the textbook, so I want to spend a minute just trying to understand what it's trying to uh, tell us. This chart is trying to review the electrolytic behavior for water-soluble compounds. 
that's probably the most important detail to notice first is that this chart here is considering compounds that are water soluble. So if we know a compound's water soluble, think about what it means if it's ionic. So for an ionic compound to be water soluble, the only category of compounds is those that totally ionize. So if we know we have a water soluble ionic compound, then the compound completely dissociates into water, then we have what we'd characterize as a strong electrolyte. So in other words, there's no examples that we can give of ionic compounds that form weakly electrolytic solutions or non-electrolytic solutions. Okay, so none and none. Now, we talked last time about how there's kind of a difference between forming a non-electrolytic solution versus just not even being an electrolyte. So the insoluble IC, so think about something that's insoluble. It's like not an electrolyte. <laughs> You know, like an electrolyte's a property of a solute particle. If it doesn't make a solute particle, how can you like classify it as any type of electrolyte? So it's like not even applicable to give that term to something that's not water soluble. So I'm just trying to make us think here that this chart isn't considering all ICs. This chart's only considering all ICs that are water soluble. So all ICs are water soluble, strong electrolytes in water. All insoluble ICs are not any type of electrolyte. They're not in the solution. They're not gonna get that term applied to them. So molecular substances, now these can be the acids, so we can have strong and weak acids. Those are molecular compounds. And so weak acids, water soluble, strong acids, water soluble, but strong acids completely dissociate. So HCl in water is completely H plus and Cl minus ions, each ion separated by its own little sphere of water molecules, whereas HF would be mostly intact as HF molecules, and a few H plus and F minus uh, particles break free. So we get some ionization, but not total. So we remain with a lot of molecules and say a weak acid solution. We also have things like weak bases, NH3, that are water soluble and would form weakly electrolytic solutions. So any other molecular compound that's not NH3, that's not a weak acid, that's not a strong acid, that we know is water soluble, is going to be forming a non-electrolytic solution. So take methanol, take glucose, like anything else that you know is molecular, contains nonmetal ions, that's not an ionic compound, it's not one of those ammonium salts, that's not NH3, that's not named as an acid, is simply a non-electrolyte. Okay, so this summary chart, again, is just considering the behavior properties we can give water-soluble compounds. So all water-soluble ICs, strong electrolytes. All water-soluble molecular compounds, we have to break those apart into the strong acids, weak acids and bases, and all the other compounds. Now, what's the one thing missing? Like, there's like one thing missing, you may be going, where's the strong bases? Just remember the strong bases are already considered here. So this includes, because the strong bases are water-soluble ICs, like KOH. So this includes the strong bases. So if you're looking at this chart going, where are the strong bases, they're already considered, in the category of water-soluble ionic compounds. Because the strong base is just the water-soluble IC containing hydroxide ion. Okay, let's see if we can put this together and start kind of, kind of coming back to thinking of full molecular versus net ionic reactions. So let's consider the reaction of barium hydroxide with um, uh, K2CO3. And so now, what our thought process should be probably first off is what type of reaction do we expect to occur or like could occur? If we see acids and bases, we're gonna think acids and bases combined to form like some kind of salt and water. Um, here we're mixing two ionic compounds. So this is gonna do one of those metathesis or exchange reactions where we're kind of considering the exchange of ions with each other where the key consideration is do we make something that's insoluble in water? Okay, so consider the, the reaction of barium hydroxide, K2CO3, and then think about the full molecular reaction. Think about how the ions actually participate in the reaction. Maybe write a full ionic reaction. And then try to simplify that down to a net ionic reaction. And just remember the spectator ions. We talked about this last time. They're the ions that are present during the reaction that don't change. So they're the sort of ions that would be in the exact same form in the reactants and the products. OK, I'll give you guys a few minutes to try this.
one more minute. Okay, let's take a look at this one. So the idea here, metathesis, we're just exchanging, if you will, the like, negative ions with each other, or think of exchanging the positive ions with each other. And then if we do so, you're getting barium paired up with carbonate. We're just mildly remembering the charges. You know, you're pairing the two plus and the two minus together and the plus one and the minus one together. And so then the question becomes, is anything a solid precipitate? Is anything insoluble? And so barium carbonate is insoluble. So that would just be a solid that would precipitate out of the solution. So we'd start with two solutions where barium hydroxide and K2CO3 are both water soluble. Barium hydroxide, barium is one of the exceptions for hydroxide. Um, potassium is one of the exceptions for carbonate. So those would both be water soluble ICs. We'd have two like, you know, clear solutions, mix them together. We'd see a solid form. That's a precipitating barium carbonate. KOH is obviously water soluble, contains potassium. Anything with potassium is water soluble. So then the question really becomes for identifying the spectator ions is just thinking about how these reactions really occur is that barium hydroxide is really not BaOH2 in the solution, right? You know, like it doesn't really have a barium and two hydroxides floating around the solution. Think about how barium hydroxide really exists in, in the solution. It's a strong electrolyte, so it completely ionizes to a barium cation and then the two hydroxide ions. So those ions are just kind of floating around its solution. And then K2CO3 is also a strong electrolyte. So my consideration here is strong electrolytes completely dissociate. So I can write the reaction with those ions fully dissociated, where I get two K plus ions dissociated, and then a carbonate ion dissociated as well. And then BaCO3 is not a strong electrolyte. It's the thing that's precipitating from the solution. So it remains intact. So all the barium and carbonate ions um, stick together. So they stick together and form that solid precipitate. And then the K plus remains dissociated. And then the OH minus, two of them remain dissociated. And so then we could cancel out and write the net ionic equation by identifying the spectator ions that are present in identical formats and in the same form on both sides of the reaction. That would be the OH minus and the K plus ions. So we could cancel those out and show the net ionic change is the barium plus the carbonate forming BaCO3. Okay, so the um, spectator ions are the ones that just kind of watch the reaction. Think about them just being present, but just kind of watching, because they don't participate in the reaction. They don't, they're not part of the net change. So they're just originally there as the K plus ion in solution. Afterwards, it's just a K plus ion in the solution. Same thing with the hydroxide ion. It's present originally as a hydroxide ion in the solution. It ends the reaction as being a hydroxide ion in the solution. So that leads to the spectators just being the K plus and the OH minus ions. So sometimes you pick tricks up. Sometimes you're like, OK, the thing that's not on the precipitate is the spectator ions. But I think the bigger issue is if you think of writing a full molecular reaction, it helps you get the stoichiometry right. Thinking of the ionization helps you understand what the solution really looks like. And then writing the net change helps you understand what the net actual change is. You know, so it's not that hard to actually just write a couple reactions, consider what's going on, and then address the particular question like identifying spectator ions. OK, so let's do um, sort of a net ionic reaction, kind of a similar question, but now where we're dealing with a, um, an acid-base reaction. So we have an acid-base reaction. We have phosphoric acid and KOH. So when I see the acid present and the base together, I know we have an acid-base reaction. And it's really almost the same idea as we were doing before of imagine the exchange of the anions with each other. And we'd get, what, water and K3PO4. 
So we were talking about this reaction earlier too. So try to think about that full reaction. We wrote the full molecular earlier. Think about writing that reaction, balancing it, thinking of the ionization, and then writing the net change. I'll give you guys a couple minutes. for a minute. Okay, so I got you. I didn't mean to get you, but I... Okay, so let's think about this one. There's one, one little trick I think we missed here, guys. When I think about breaking things up into the net ionic reaction, when I'm considering writing the ionization, like for KOH, I write K plus and OH minus. I do so because it's a strong electrolyte. Is H3PO4 a strong electrolyte? No, it's a weak acid, so it doesn't exist as ions in the solution. So I'm thinking, what does a solution look like that contains phosphoric acid? Well, it mostly just contains the H3PO4 molecules. That's going to be the best description of that solution. So it's not a strong electrolyte, so I don't ionize it in the ionic equation. So I keep it intact. It's still water-soluble, but it's just not ions. And then K plus and OH minus are ions. The K3PO4 is a water-soluble IC, so that's three K pluses, and that's a phosphate ion. Um, and really, I should include the three here. So this is three K pluses and three hydroxide ions. 
And then my water is also intact as H2O, so that's three H2O still. It's not a strong electrolyte, it's just a non-electrolyte. So I'm thinking, think about how the substance exists in water. Does it exist in water as 100% ions or not? And if it's not, then we just keep it intact, even if it's a weak electrolyte. So there are some ions, but not many for H3PO4. A better description is keeping the weak and non-electrolytes as their full molecular uh, description. And so the only spectator ion here is K+, so the net change is phosphoric plus a hydroxide goes to phosphate plus water. Okay, I've mentioned this millions of times before. You're not losing points generally when you get answers wrong, so don't feel too stressed out if you do get an answer wrong, but try to just realize that we learned something here, that the weak electrolytes, non-electrolytes, we keep intact um, for their reactions. Okay, so uh, let's just summarize. Um, our, well, not really summarize, but let's end our discussion of acids and bases with this slide here. This slide here is showing us that you can describe some kind of weird acid-base reactions like carbonate reacting with HCl. You would ordinarily imagine acid plus base here would form H2CO3. So as you imagine H2CO3 being formed, that that just decomposes into CO2 and water. So you end up getting a gas that forms when you take carbonates and react them with acid. Um, and so then uh, you might imagine the CO2 bubbling away. This is a type of reaction that you could kind of do, say, in like in a volcano demonstration. But really, uh, more than that being maybe pretty to look at, is seeing that once you form a gas and it floats away, you can't go backwards. You know, like one of the, the main lessons here of uh, the metathesis and the acid-base reaction is you have to form something that forms and doesn't go backwards. That's kind of why it's important to recognize that water remains intact and doesn't ionize because once the H plus and the OH minuses find each other and pair up, it stays intact, doesn't go backwards. Once we make CO2 gas, it floats away and therefore it can't ever go backwards back over to the reactant side. So when you see a gas being formed in a reaction, when you see a solid being formed as a precipitate or water being formed as a liquid, those are signs that you have a reaction that can take place. So you take hydrogen carbonate plus HBr, that again forms H2CO3, and then H2CO3 decomposes to water and um, H2O. Carbonic acid's weird. You can name carbonic acid. It doesn't, doesn't really exist in water, though. So you can write this, but it's really just H2O and CO2 in water. So you can name the substance, but it really doesn't ever exist in water as H2CO3. It would just decompose into water and CO2. Sulfides do something similar where they react with acid, they form hydrogen sulfide gas, not a pleasant odor, smells like rotten eggs, uh, but that also forms a gas that floats away. So the main lesson here isn't to memorize these reactions, but it's more to sort of notice that if you have a gas form in a reaction, then that gas floats away, and then the products can never recombine and go back to the reactant side. So it's, it's uh, something we can notice in a reaction that helps drive the reaction towards completion. So the, the key indicators are solid precipitates, water being formed, or some sort of gas that floats away. So with that, we're gonna head in and talk, to, talk about another type of reaction that generally can occur in water. That's a redox reaction or an oxidation reduction reaction. Uh, people always have one of these two things memorized from high school. You either have the Leo, the lion goes grr, and then other people feel strongly that that's dumb and you should say oil rig. I don't, I'm sure you guys remember one of these. These are helping us remember what oxidation is. So oxidation is the loss of electrons. So a substance that loses electrons in a reaction is oxidized. And then a sub substance that gains electrons is reduced. So gaining electrons is reducing, or reduced, reducing is gaining. So a substance that gains electrons is undergoing reduction. So we could look at maybe an example of two um, elements combining iron and oxygen. The charges of uh, elements, so we know we have metallic, we have elemental iron because we just have Fe with nothing else. So it's just the elemental form. So none of the iron atoms can have a charge. So all the iron atoms in an iron sample would have no charge. Same thing with the charge um, in O2. So all the oxygen atoms would be uncharged in an O2 gas sample. Then if they combine to form Fe2O3, we probably remember that means we have iron three oxide so we have the three plus and the O2 minuses. So we probably remember these ionic charges from chapter two um, from perhaps our nomenclature. But what you can see here is that iron is, what's, is it losing electrons or gaining electrons? It's losing electrons. So Fe loses three electrons. So it will just say it loses electrons. So therefore it's oxidized. 
And then the oxygen in the reaction, the O atom is gaining the electrons. So it gains electrons. Therefore, that atom is reduced during the reaction. So you're looking at the element on the reactant side, seeing how it changes into the product side, then identifying how you could classify oxygen. So oxygen here, gaining electrons to the two minus, so therefore it's reduced. Now, I'm going to blow your mind for a second and tell you that iron actually serves as the reducing agent. And then oxygen serves as the, um, so O2 gas would be the oxidizing agent. So imagine the word agent afterwards. The agent is the facilitator. So uh, when I classify iron as being a reducing agent, what it's doing is, did I lose my signal? Ah. I think I OK, so the oxidizing agent term, we say O2 serves as the oxidizing agent. CH4 is the reducing agent. Generally, the agent term, you apply to the substance. And usually, oxidize and reduce, you look at the individual atoms. So notice how I'm saying like O2 as the substance is serving as the oxidizing agent. CH4 as the substance, because it contains the C atom, is acting as the reducing agent. So the agent is usually a term you give to the substance containing the atom that is either oxidized or reduced um, in the reaction. And you can identify individual atoms as the ones that have undergone the reduction or the oxidation. Um, so you might have a question on a reaction like this one here, like the CH4 plus O2 reaction. Is this an oxidation reduction reaction? And the task would be assign oxidation numbers, see if you can identify atoms that are gaining and losing electrons tandemly together. And if you can, it is a redox reaction, then perhaps you'll be asked to identify the atoms that have undergone reduction or oxidation. OK, instead of looking at an example of like picking out a reaction is or isn't an oxidation reduction reaction, we'll probably do one of those examples um, the start of the next lecture. Let's just go through the oxidation rules, because I think this is best exemplified through examples. Um, so like uh, for oxygen and aluminum, we actually already know their charges. Like I know aluminum only forms a 3 plus, And I know oxygen should be the ordinary minus 2, um, with the exceptions again, peroxides, superoxides, and compounds with F. None of those cases here apply. So that would just be an ordinary minus 2O. And then the oxidation numbers, just like charges, should add up. So I should have a plus 6, minus 6, equaling 0. So I should get the charge on the, on the unit here. It's an uncharged. Al2O3 doesn't carry a charge. Um, if it did, there would have been a charge indicated. So if like Al2O3 carried a charge, you know, there'd be some charge indicated up above. If there's no charge, we're assuming that it's 0. Does that make sense? Um, and so then we look at Ca3N2. Again, this actually turns out to be a case where this is an ordinary compound of calcium with a 2 plus charge. We know that's the only charge calcium can have. That gives me a 6 plus. So I have to have a 6 minus spread across the two ends, making each end have a charge or an oxidation number of minus 3. So whenever I have an ionic compound that's comprised of simple ions, then the idea of charge and oxidation numbers are synonymous with each other. You know, so like, Charge and oxidation numbers for those types of compounds are synonymous with each other. Um, and we kind of already know a lot about those charges from like naming back in chapter two. So you may be looking at like CA3, like determining these oxidation numbers isn't quite new for us. It's just maybe calling the charges those ions contain um, their oxidation numbers. Um, and so then CAS, so up two plus, two minus. So sulfur minus two, just like oxygen. Um, and, and it does have. Um, some exceptions. A couple exceptions will come up naturally, and we'll see that as we go through some examples. Barium hydroxide, we know barium's a 2 plus, it's an alkaline metal. Um, so making the H plus, uh, the, the H is here minus 1 in charge. So that would be barium hydride if we were naming this compound. So hydride is just a simple atomic ion of H minus, just like chloride, Cl minus, nitrites, uh, N3 minus. Now, the other examples down here are mostly going to be molecular compounds. Like, notice here we have OF2. So the question with, like, O and F, and there's a general rule that F goes minus 1 in compounds and never really changes off of minus 1 for its oxidation number. This has to do with electronegativity. The F's more electronegative than O. It's going to want the negative charge more than the O. And so then we're going to keep F at minus 1. There's two of them, so we get a minus 2, making the entire O2 have a plus 2 um, oxidation number spread across the two. We'll divide by two, so we get a plus one. 
So the compound O2F2 would have an oxygen with an oxidation number of plus one and fluorine with its ordinary minus one. So what you're gonna find is that for the most part, a lot of compounds, either you'll know the oxidation numbers of everything or you'll be able to deduce the one thing you don't know. So when I look at like KO2, K is always plus. So it's usually like identify the atom that you know the charge of for sure and then identify the oxidation numbers of the other elements that you're not sure about. So we got a plus one. For the entire O2 group, there has to be a minus one spread across the two of them. So the oxidation number per O is minus a half. So just remember the oxidation number is like a per atom number. And then we have to factor in how many atoms there are. So plus one minus two times a half is equal to zero. So I'm factoring in here my minus one charge across the two O's gives me a minus a half on each. Now, not many uh, atoms will have a fractional uh, oxidation number. This is one of the rare cases. So most of the time, you're not going to find a fraction. But this fraction here is for this superoxide. So this is that potassium superoxide. And you might remember that's the case of an O2 with the minus charge. So we're just bringing that minus across the two O's. So each O has a minus one half charge um, and being classified here oxidation number. Ca2 plus, so then we have a minus two spread across the two O's, so that means the oxidation number per O is minus one. And so that would be calcium peroxide. CO2, ordinary, uh, so we might look at the oxygen, we know it's a minus two, there's two of them for a minus four, so that's how we identify carbon as a plus four. So kind of start with what you know and then deduce what you don't know. And then O2. Trick here is that this isn't a peroxide or superoxide because those only form with alkali and alkaline cation. So this has to be just a regular oxide ion times two. So this is just manganese plus four oxide. When we get these big sort of, bigger sort of molecules of these uh, polyatomic ions, just go back to the charges. We know that perchlorate's a minus one charge. There's two of them, so that means we have copper with a plus two charge and hence oxidation number. And so I can either picture ClO4 as two chunks as part of this molecule, or maybe just break it apart into one ClO4 minus, so where the oxygen has to stay minus two. So again, oxygen's rule, it's minus two with the exceptions peroxide, superoxides, and compounds with F. This isn't any of those exceptions. So it means it has the ordinary minus two. We've got four of them for a minus eight. We have to sum up to a total of minus one. So what's the oxidation number on chlorine have to be to give this overall ion a minus one charge? It has to be seven. So we deduce that the oxidation number of chlorine here is plus seven. The oxygen is minus two. Now, it's more arith uh, uh, arithmetic. The, the math is more tricky if we picture the entire group together, but we could still do it. We just have to have copper's charge and then two times chlorine and then eight times oxygen equaling zero. So you could keep the two perchlorate units together totaling zero, but the math gets a little bit trickier. But if you can pick one of the ions out and identify its charge, you can identify the oxidation numbers that way too, just like we did for perchlorate. ClF3, rule for F is it's minus. There's three of them. And so the charge on chlorine, or the oxidation number on chlorine would be plus three. So rules are relatively simple. They're not that complicated. The halogen atoms, chlorine's usually minus one. And its exceptions, so like chloride or chlorine, bromine, iodine's exceptions are when they form compounds with like oxygen and fluorine, where oxygen keeps its minus two, fluorine keeps its minus one, and they might adjust accordingly. Uh, but in other molecules, chlorine just an ordinary minus one. There's four of them for a minus four. Carbon stays as a plus four. Okay, so there's not many rules. The, the rules are just that the halogen is usually minus one, um, and there's just like a, a category for when some charges are trumping others. Like F is going to basically beat everything else. O comes next uh, in terms of keeping its minus two charge um, in favor of elements like chlorine becoming the positively charged atoms. So I guess the last thing I'll summarize for today is that you can then sort of look at the relative reactivity trends of metals and identify that not all of the reactivity trends are the same. Um, that our alkali and alkali metals are much more reactive. They're much more likely to lose electrons and exist as their plus charged cations. Whereas metals at the bottom of this chart are much less reactive and they're more likely to exist as their neutral uh, metal uh, substances. So like gold, is very unlikely to dissociate or to uh, 
to lose its electrons and form a gold solution. Um, so gold's going to remain more intact. Notice that these metals here are much more precious. These are the ones we tend to make coins and jewelry out of because they're not going to easily react with other substances. If we made a necklace out of sodium and it started raining, our ring is going to dissolve. So we're not going to make um, precious uh, substances out of things that readily dissolve. So we'll pick up probably with this example next time of how we can use this chart to help us predict when reactions take place and move forward from there. All right, guys, have a great day.